Well, to say we've had an unusual and interesting week um, is to uh, dismiss the challenges so many of us have gone through. But we've gone through. We've gone through it and we're okay. And it's kind of cool that uh, so many of our members helped each other out and helped out our community. And then came up here and helped us out. So way to go. Thank you so much. Why don't we open the prayer? Father God, we thank you for this time and this place. We thank you for your word. Now, Lord, may it open in our hearts. May it come to life. May your Holy Spirit just move in this moment. Would it bring to our understanding challenges that we face, difficulties that are ours, maybe things that we harbor, things that we have not yet forgiven. Bring that up, God. Because this morning, Lord, we would love your word to come in and cleanse that and begin to heal. So we trust you that you are the living word of Christ. It's your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We've been in the uh, letters to the seven churches for the last seven weeks. Today is our last week, which is the Church of Philadelphia. Chronologically, that's not how it happens in the book of Revelation, but it's the, uh, it's the most fun of the books, and so I thought I'd save it to the last. It uh, has no words of, of condemnation at all, just words of great commendation and of open opportunities. And so what I want to talk to you about today is this particular book through the eyes of two different perspectives. One is this idea of opening and shutting, and the other is this concept of a new name. So let's get into it. It says in the book of Revelation, the third chapter, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And I know that you have little strength, that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Of the seven churches, this is the smallest of the churches. And that's what he's referring here to, that not that they, they had little faith, but that they were a little church. And they saw themselves as being a small church without hardly any influence. And so they tended not to seize great opportunities that were in front of them because their mental picture was, there's not much to us. And God now speaks to him, them through the prophet or through the writer of John. So this, this idea of key of David, it's only mentioned twice in scripture. And to understand it, you have to go back to the original time it was used in the Old Testament because so much of the revelation comes out of an understanding of the Old Testament, specifically word pictures. And so if we go back to the, the book of Isaiah, we'll understand this idea of this key of David. Let me take you to Isaiah 22. This is a message for Sheba. This is what the Lord, the Lord of the heaven's armies said, confront Sheba, the palace administrator or the palace servant, if you will, and give him this message. Who do you think you are? And what are you doing? You're building a beautiful tomb for yourself, a monument high up in the rocks. For the Lord is about to hurl you away, mighty man. He is going to grab you, crumble you to a ball, and toss you away into a distant barren land. There you will die, and your glorious chariots will be broken and useless. You are a disgrace to your master. Yes, I will drive you out of office, says the Lord, and I will put you down from your high position. And then I will call my servant Eclem to replace you. I will dress him in your royal robes and give him the title and your authority. And he will be father to his people of Jerusalem and Judea. And I will give him the key to the house of David, the highest position in the royal court. And when he opens the door, no one will be able to close it. And when he closes the door, no one will be able to open. So what does that mean? That, was, that means there was a, a guy in this kingdom who had no authority. 
And he actually was trying to make himself a big deal when he wasn't. He was actually trying to steal from the treasury that was locked behind a closed door that only one person had the key. It was sort of like in our understanding, a master key. So there was a door with a lock, but then there was a bolt lock, and that was the only one key would open that, and it belonged to the king, not the king's servant. And so the king's servant was thinking, well, if I can get into the wealth and the riches that are behind that door, I can make myself a big deal. And he's like, what are you doing? None of that is yours. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the one who has the authority to open that door and disperse it like he wants. And so he gives it to another and makes him the king and says, at this point, this is now going to belong to you, this key of David. And it will open to you all of the riches of heaven. Everything that belongs to me will now be given to you. And whenever you unlock that door and you open it, you disperse it as you will. But when you close it and you lock it, there's no one that can have access to it. Now, there's this interesting piece in here that he talks about this opening and this shutting. And he says these exact same words now to this little church. What is he saying? You see yourself as insignificant to the kingdom, Philadelphia. You see yourself as this little church with no power and no authority. And so in his identification in the front, he says, I, Jesus, have this, this key. I have the key to open up the opportunities, and I have the key to shut them down. And I have counted you worthy to be handed the key. You now have the opportunity to open the vault of heaven, the promises, the riches, the opportunities. They're yours. And whatever you open and whatever you distribute, that's now yours. And whatever you choose to lock, that's yours. And so my question for you this morning is, what would you do if God said that to you? What would you do if God literally handed you the key of his own riches and his own grace? And he said, here's the key. And I want you to know that you have the opportunity, the privilege of opening the kingdom of heaven to whoever you want. And you have the kingdom, you have the ability to take your key and as well lock away those things which can't come out. Because you see, that's, that's what Jesus did for us. He opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you were given that key. And you hold that key. You hold that key of the message of the gospel. That's what you heard in both the New Testament readings today. Paul had it and he understood. I have the key in the midst of my prison that I can praise God and the key will open my imprisonment. Paul asked for their prayer that if, if an opportunity happens in my life, give me the words I need to say. And so my question comes to you. Who are the people in your life that you have the power to open the kingdom of heaven for. I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way. But you have friends who are maybe far from God, people who feel distant from him, who don't know him. Maybe you're even angry or bitter towards him. And whenever you're with them, you hold the key. It's yours. And you may have the same problem that Philadelphia has and go, you know, I, I just, I don't, I don't see myself as that kind of person. I don't, I don't know the scripture that well. I don't know how to defend the faith. This isn't about you. This is about the key that's in your hand. That you have the ability to open the kingdom of heaven 
to the person you're standing with. You have the message of the gospel. You have the truth of his word. You have the grace and mercy and forgiveness that's been given to you and is behind the closed door of the person you're sitting with maybe. And they need that door opened and you have the key. My other question for you though is, what doors are you shutting? What doors need to shut in your life? What doors have you left open that have no business being open? Doors of regret, doors of anger, doors of pride, of arrogance, of selfishness, of past hurts and past pains, of unforgiveness. You see, those doors, we also have the power in our life to close and keep them shut. Because in those closed doors are things that lurk to destroy us. Satan wants to use that stuff, that garbage, and bring it to us and remind us that we don't have the power to open the gospel. And we live in fear that that stuff might leak out. And he's saying, no, you have power over the accusations of Satan. You have that power. And when those come, when those temptations come, when that pain comes back, when your bitterness rises in you again, you have the key to shut that door and not let it open again. That's your power and that's your authority. And you may say, Doug, you have no clue. You have no clue what's going on. You don't have no clue what's going on in my marriage right now. You have no clue what's going on in my secret life. You have no clue the struggles and the battle with sin and shame and regret I live with. Yes, I do. Because I know Satan. I know what he does. I know his methods. And you have the key. I don't care what's your struggle. I don't care what's your issue. I don't care what's your problem. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You have nothing to be bitter about because you have the key that locks the door of your past. You have the key that can shut down what's currently causing you so much stress and pain. And as you face challenges in your future, you have the key to close those fears. So you have both of those. He goes on. He says, and I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan. Remember, those were the Messianic Jews we learned about a couple of weeks ago. Because in Sardis, there was so much persecution of Messianic Jews, Jews who had turned to become Christians, that there would be people who were not Messianic Jews, who were just Jews, And they would say, since they were being kind of grandfathered in and not persecuted or or martyred, people were going around and saying, well, I'm a a Christian Jew, when in fact they weren't. He calls them uh, living in the household of Satan. He says, who claim to be Jews, and though they are not, they are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. One day, one day, the truth will be revealed about you and about them. Now, this idea that they will, they will bow down at your feet, that's not exactly the, the best way to understand it. It's, it's that they will bow down with you. They're not going to bow down to you. Don't worry. You're not that great. But they will bow down with you. The Bible says in Philippians 2, one day, every knee will bow. One day, Everyone who has claimed they were going to get to heaven because they were good enough and who turned their their self away from Jesus, one day they are going to bow and acknowledge, oh yeah, he was the guy. And they'll bow down in terror and regret, but you and I will bow down in worship and thanksgiving. "Since Since you have kept my command and endured patiently, I will also 
keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Now, some believe that this is sort of God's going to hold an umbrella over you to keep bad stuff from happening. I think you and I are pretty aware that's not what God does. God instead gives us a key. I don't have to choose to live in the pain and suffering and difficulty of my life. I don't have to live in the negativity and the unforgiveness that's that's in my soul. I get to lock that away. And in the midst of the challenges of my life, I get to welcome in the protection and the grace and the hope of God. He says, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown, your your key, your, your authority. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will they leave it. He's promising there that he will rescue them and protect them. So let's go on to this next piece of this new name. I want to go back for a second to Isaiah because it will give us again insight. Isaiah says, and he will bring honor to the family name. For I will drive him firmly into a place like a nail in the wall. This is going to be a prophecy of Jesus coming. And he's going he's to place firmly in this wall, this nail. He's referring to Jesus. I will one day bring something and pound it into the culture of this earth. And they will give him great responsibility and he will bring honor even to the lowliest members of the family. He's saying when Jesus comes... He's not going to come for the big shots. He's going to come for the little guy. Philadelphia, you identify with being the little guy. Jesus is coming for you. But the Lord of heaven's armies also says, the time it will come when I will put out the nail. I will pull out the nail that seems so firm. It will come out and the weight of it will fall to the ground. And everything that it supports will fall with it. I, the Lord, have spoken. What the heck does he mean? This is, again, a veiled prophecy that this nail that has been placed into the earth, into this world, into the brokenness and the heartache of which we experience, this nail of Jesus will be nailed to a wall, but it will be taken out. And when it's removed... The weight that was on it will be, re- will be removed as well. When Jesus went to the cross for you, the weight of your sin, the weight of your shame, the weight of your guilt, the weight even of times of your unbelief, All of that weight, the Bible tells, was put on him, was hung on that nail. And when it's pulled out, all of your sin, all of your your brokenness, all of it will be crushed to the ground and exist no more. I think that's something you and I need to understand. But the reason God has given us great privilege with this key is because he knew the things that, that um, chew away, eat away at the authority of, of we believers is our shame and our guilt and our sin. And he's saying, no, I am pulling that out. And what Jesus bore on your behalf will be gone. You'll be something new. You'll be something different. So he goes on and talks about that. He says, I will write a new name of my God in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. Well, the brilliance of Jesus writing these letters is that he understands the circumstances and the culture to which he's writing, just like he does in our life. This was a church that was bound up by their belief they didn't have the power to open up and shut up anything. 
That was for the big churches. That was for the deep Christians. But the other problem they had as a church is they kept changing their name. They started out as New Caesarea. And then they would change their name and change their name. And he says, no, let me change your name. I will give you a new name. And that name will be written down out of heaven. What is he talking about? Well, if you think about Scripture, and you just follow it, when God intersects and intervenes in the life of a person, he gives them a new name. Remember, Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Simon became Peter. Saul became Paul. Why did he do that? Because he wanted them to know they were a new creation. Before that, they didn't see themselves as being used by God or even able to be used by God. But once God says, no, I have a plan. I have a plan in your it. How I am going to bless the world, how I'm going to open the kingdom to all believers is going to be through you. And I'm going to take away your name that has so much brokenness and baggage, and I'm going to give you a new name. He says, where I'm going to put it is I'm going to put it on your forehead. I'm going to write a new name on you, and you will be identified by something new. That's why it's an, it's an important thing when we watch a baptism. And on Isabella's head, there was a cross. That was her new name. It was the name forgiven. Not loser, not ugly, not addicted, not selfish, not hurt, not prideful, not bitterness. The new name of forgiven. My child. And so I want you to do that this morning. I want you to just take your fingers and, and put them on your forehead. And I want you to just say, my new name is forgiven. Do this with me. F forgiven. And he says, that mark, that mark will never go away. That mark will never fade. That mark will never shade. Once you grasp that truth, your name will change. And you'll begin to see that in your hands, you hold the key of David, the key of mercy, the key of compassion, the key of grace, the key of forgiveness. It's yours. And you get to choose whoever's in your life. I get to open that door because of my name. And I get to invite them into the kingdom of God. And the hurt and pain and disappointment those people caused me, the way I don't agree with them, I also have the key to lock up and put away that barrier between me and them. Why can I do that? Because God has put on me a new name. Let's pray. Father, how could we possibly have adequate thanks for what you have done in our life? You have given us something we could never deserve. You've given us an authority and a power that is not ever going to be from us. And it allows us, God, to open the riches of heaven. Holy moly, God, why would you do that to such irresponsible, unequipped people? Because, God, you don't see our sin and you don't see our failure. You don't see our inadequacy. You see the power and the authority of which you have given us 
for the salvation on the cross. And God, may we choose to live in our new name, to see ourselves in a new way, and to behave in a way to which you've called us. We pray this for Christ's sake. Amen.